Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you to Sue Ellen and everyone who organizes this wonderful book festival that makes um, this island a better place every other year. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, today's panel, Writing the Self, is um, a very big umbrella. Um, <laughs> I said it was a Frankenstein of a panel. Um, four incredible writers and talented people in many other ways under this very broad subject. Um, so we're good. this is going to be kind of free ranging. Um, I'm going to just introduce everybody briefly. Their longer bios on the website are in your program. Charles Blow, the author of Fire Shut Up in My Bones has been a columnist at the New York Times since 2008. He is also a frequent contributor to CNN and NBC. Um, the author of Let's Be Less Stupid, Patricia Marks, who used to be Patty Marks, um, is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a former writer for Saturday Night Live. Mary Norris, whose book Between You and Me is either a memoir or a reference book, I thought maybe Mary, you should call it a refoir, <laughs> is also an employee of the New Yorker magazine. She's worked in the editorial department there since 1978. Barney Frank is a man who perhaps needs no introduction. The author of Frank, A Life in Politics from the Great Society to Same-Sex Marriage, Mr. Frank is also a former congressman who represented the fourth district of the great state of Massachusetts for more than three decades. Um, I want to start today with a, a um, sort of big question, which is, um, in my experience, there are very few people who are actually memoirists by trade. Most, writer, most memoirs are written either by writers who, for whom the memoir is a one-off. They're writers in other genres, or like Barney Frank, are not writers by profession. Um, so. This begs the question for each of you, um, why memoir and why this book that we have, these books we have in front of us, why these books now? Um, Mary, you want to start? Well, I have written all kinds of things, fiction and nonfiction and travel writing and a blog, and I never had any luck publishing anything until I started writing about commas. <laughs> the New Yorker needed somebody to defend our commas from someone who had written the, that they were nutty on the New York Times blog. So I didn't, you know, I thought, commas? Come on, I can do better than that. But um, it took off, and then they had me write about other things. And this was the package that the agent, that I finally was able to interest an agent in, and the agent was in, could interest the publisher. It's because uh, I worked at the New Yorker that had some cachet, and I have been a copy editor for 30 years, so I was expected to know something about commas. <laughs> I also write in a lot of genres. Um, I always say I'm, I'm so superficial that I tend to write comedy, whatever genre I'm in. Um, I don't really consider myself a memoirist. Um, I write about myself because I have a lot of expertise in that field. Um, and in fact, I have a contract to write a memoir and I keep I so don't want to write it that I've written, I wrote that, this is why I wrote the book I did and I'm going to write another one so that I don't. And the memoir I am supposedly writing, I wrote the first sentence and a few others and the first sentence is, this book could be a lot funnier if more people would die. I mean, I don't want to write about alive people. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to give you a semi-pass. Okay. We're going to call it a memoir for today, so okay. you'll have to live with it. Barney. Well, first, I, I was thinking when you said very few people are only memoir writers, and it strikes me if all you did was write memoirs, you would have nothing mm. to write about in your memoir. Exactly. So it would seem to me you must exactly. have done something else to have a subject. Um, in my case, I was actually, uh, it was a compromise. I wanted to write a book of political advocacy. In particular, I am troubled that uh, government is held in bad repute these days. I think we suffer uh, from people voting against their own self-interest because they've been persuaded that government's a bad thing. 
and I wanted to uh, write an argument. I write two things in mind. First, I wanted to write to persuade people that government was a good thing and to lay out a plan that I thought we could follow for accomplishing that. Uh, secondly, I wanted to uh, lecture my friends on the left about how to be effective in politics because uh, the extent to which people on the left occasionally choose emotive means uh, rather than practical ones uh, troubles me. Um, I was told that that by itself would not probably get published or, <laughs> or bought very widely if it was. So the editor suggested that my life was interesting and I should put it in that frame. And uh, so um, we, we had this kind of compromise in which I wanted to write about, I wanted advocacy, he wanted it personal, and that the book is the result. I will say, in the judgment, I want to be honest, uh, I try to be self-critical where it's appropriate, in the, uh, in the view of one of Mr. Bo's colleagues, I do not impute the view to him, I failed. Uh, Frank Bruni, who was the uh, gay reporter of the New York Times, in the Sunday book review complained that in my book, I did not talk enough about how much sex I was having and whether or not I wanted to have more. Um, I was a little taken aback that that was in the Times. Apparently, he had anticipated Fifty Shades of Frank. Um, and I said, I, my problem was that even if I wanted to do that, I'm not sure I could have gotten much past 17 or 18. But um, uh, So having said that, I mean, apparently he wanted more personal. But essentially, it was I wanted to write an advocacy book. And, and uh, I was persuaded, and I think that the, the memoir, because it's a memoir of my public life, not so much my, 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 my private life, uh, sets the frame for the advocacy. Charles? Yeah, I, I think there are professional memoirs. I mean, I, I was just thinking about that question myself. I, th I think every book Maya Angela ever wrote was memoir. I think she wrote seven memoirs about her own life. Yeah, um, you're right. There um, are, there are but she did a lot of other things, too. I mean, she uh, was, right, right. right. Uh, she wrote poetry. But, yeah, she wrote poetry. Right. right. Um, anyway, but I didn't set out to write a book, um, and I and uh, I kind of haphazardly found my way into writing, in of any sort. Um, I started writing small essays that I thought I would be able to sell to a magazine about my life, and I never got around to selling them, and the they kept growing, and I I was writing them. I had this bizarre, crazy commute that I don't know, I don't know anybody else who ever had it. I mm -hmm. commuted from Brooklyn to DC every morning and back every night. Oh. So it was three hours. I did this for almost two years and I hated wasting the time, so I would write. Um, and it got to be more and more and more words and so I started to look for the, say, maybe there's something else here and maybe there's a narrative in it. And after I took the job as a columnist at the New York Times and I, you know, I, I'm writing about other people's lives, it became very more apparent to me that it was important to examine my own life if I was going to spend my professional career examining other people's lives. And that became the genesis of the book. And no one, my, you know, my agent, no one wanted me to write a memoir. They wanted me to write a book that felt like the column. Hmm. Um, and. I, you know, I would say, oh yes, I'm working on that, and I wasn't working on it at all. <laughs> right? And I was continuing to work on this book. Right. Well, um, on that note, um, if you don't mind, I just want to read a, a quote from your book, Charles. Um, Charles writes, daring to step into oneself is the bravest, strangest, most natural, terrifying thing a person can do because once you cease to wrap yourself in artifice, you are naked and when you are naked, you are vulnerable. Um, this is a, a question for you and for Barney. Um, both of you write quite candidly and movingly about your sexuality in your books, coming to terms with it and integrating that truth into your life in open and positive ways. But for both of you, this aspect of your personality created a sense of isolation, it seems, for, for some years. Um, I wondered if you could talk about how you began to move out of the darkness that may have created in your life, keep, keeping either keeping it a secret or not having processed what that mean, meant out in um, your broader life, and specifically what the experience of writing about it in the books you wrote 
did for the experience of processing that? Well, I, the, the, the sense of self was not um, particularly traumatic for me. Uh, what was traumatic was uh, childhood sexual abuse and trying to understand, put that in context of a life and, and to figure out what that meant. And, you know, it is, um, it is a particular trauma to have your first sexual experience be that, uh, uh, be a, um, of a sexual violence, of a psychological violence. Um, and to have the abuser become a bully and have that person be part of your family where you can't escape them um, is, is compounds that mm -hmm. sense of uh, tragedy and pain and hurt. The, the, the sense of self and, and how you form what becomes your sense of attraction and your um, sense of sexuality, that to me was never really a big thing. I always thought to myself, if I had been able to contextualize the, the, the abuse and to, you know, and had access to mm -hmm. therapists, we were, we, were comp we were dirt poor, we lived in a tiny town, middle of nowhere, and a thousand people. I mean, I never saw, I, I, first time I saw a doctor, I was, a, I was on the high school basketball team and, the, and none of us had ever been to the doctor. He put us on a bus and took us to a doctor because the, the state said you had to have a, a medical examination to play from now on. And that was the first time I'd ever been to a doctor. Um, so it was just this idea of treatment was a, a real thing. So I was having to deal with it from the age of seven mm -hmm. forward on my own. And that's it's just too much for a kid to deal with. And that was the trauma mm -hmm. for me. The, the idea of self, I just, I just don't, I don't, I don't even understand how that's traumatic. Like I, you know, it, I identify as bisexual. I can be attracted to men and women. I don't know. I think of you know whenever people say they can't, I'm like that's bizarre. You know, like to me, I don't understand because it's not a lived experience for me. So, so what 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 is my lived experience? I just I can't make it strange. Right. Though you talk about in the book uh, feeling of being a child and having people having people in your community um, kind of. A pro, give you kind of negative attention for the way you walked or the way right I, that and that but that it was all it was all kind of uh, but that wasn't me dealing with it right so that was me dealing with external with pressures them. right that was that was me trying mm -hmm. to figure out how, why that is coming to me why they view my essential self in a negative mm -hmm. and whether or not I will ab adopt and absorb their projection of me onto me mm -hmm. or if I will accept my own sense of self. Uh, and maybe there is some working through of that, but, but it just never felt to me like my own sense of self was a, was a weight. What about you, Barney? Well, I uh, never felt personally guilty or embarrassed. I mean, this is a fact of my life. Uh, I realized that when I was 13 and uh, it was a fact. Um, I have to put this in context. This is 1953. Um, this is a time when the New York Times, in its headlines, is talking about sex perverts. Uh, when a Democratic Senate committee in 1950, three years earlier, had talked about uh, the, the reasons not to employ homosexuals and other perverts in the federal government, uh, you know, on up to when uh, John Kennedy's director of personnel said that no homosexuals should be allowed to work for the federal government. So um, I didn't feel bad. Um, on the other hand, from at that point, the notion of fighting this was just overwhelming. So what I did was to compartmentalize it. Um, I just said, okay. Uh, in fact, the way it, I try to think back, I realized now I'm 13. My friends, contemporaries, are starting to have sexual feelings early sexual activity, uh, uh, not yet uh, genital, but uh, et cetera. And I, my first sense was, okay, this is a part of life I just won't participate in, but I'll do everything else. So I, I had a very happy childhood. I had a very normal teenage childhood. I had a, a normal college experience. Uh, I had this sense of denial, and I suppose it was in some ways it was almost like, you know, being colorblind, there'd be times when people would be talking about the wonderful paintings, and I couldn't see it. There'd be people talking about their great sexual activity, and I couldn't feel that either. Uh, um, and I, I think that might have 
kept on, I began to figure out, well, you know, this will be missing. Then I started to think, okay, well, maybe it is possible for me uh, to have a sexual life because I talk about 1953, but 1969, I mean, there was nothing in American history where there was a dividing line as sharp in my judgment as on LGBT rights before and after Stonewall in 69. And so I began to think about it, but then I had a choice to make because by that time I had decided that I wanted to be in politics. So from then, for some period, there was a self-imposed denial because I considered a political career uh, more important than, than fully embracing my sexuality. Fully embracing it publicly, not, not privately. And uh, as I write in the book, what, what happens is from 1972 on, uh, I am pleased to see the world getting less and less homophobic. So I'm getting out further and further. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was ready finally to come out publicly because I was gonna leave elected politics in 19, 79 and 1979 and 80, I began to uh, get ready to come out. And then, um, while well, people are very happy as I am with Pope Francis's uh, relatively enlightened view about homosexuality, for me personally, the, uh, the patron pope of LGBT rights is John Paul II, because Father Robert Drinan was serving in Congress from the district next to mine, <laughs> and Pope John Paul II ordered him to leave Congress and created a congressional seat for me. So <laughs> I, uh, I owe my congressional career to, to uh, 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 John Paul II. Um, but at that point, again, I, I made the conscious choice. Okay, here I have a chance to get out to the Congress and do what I most want to do in the world, make this a fairer place, et cetera. But I could not win if people knew I was gay. You know, I, I damn near lost because some people suspected it in 1980. We were getting better. So in 1980, I made the conscious choice to go to, to, to shut down the coming out. And when I got to Congress, though, I said, okay, I'm starting again. And things were getting better and better. And there were two things going on. One, I was getting more and more safely entrenched in my district by doing things uh, that would be helpful. And two, homophobia was decreasing. And finally, in 1987, the lines crossed, and I was able to come out publicly. Nice. Um. Mary and Patty, um, you've both written delightful, funny, charming, fascinating books. Patty, I always count on you for the morning, um, for not necessarily morning, but it's spit take um, every time I read your columns. And Mary, having read your book, I have to tell you that I never thought I would find it so compelling, the question of why a gross of Dixon Ticonderoga pencils were uh, <laughs> damaged. <laughs> Um, I, 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 your book made me feel like you had taken the, the spinach of grammar and cooked it into the chocolate chip cookie of a, <laughs> of a career memoir, and it really was fantastic. And Patty, your neuroscience test is, you know, kind of stitched together with this, these personal stories. I wondered if either of you had models you worked with, or you, or were there any for either of you books that, or things which you, which gave you the idea to do both of these books or were they just, um, did they just come whole? Well, I can say that it didn't come whole. <laughs> <laughs> um, my original idea for this book was just a, a collection of short essays. The way that I read books on language is just to flip them open in the middle and read whatever's there. But my editor didn't want to publish a collection of blog posts and wanted something that you started at the beginning and read till the end. And everything, there had to be a good balance. Um, you know, I kept telling myself, well, they bought a book from me, so that means they want me. So I'd give them lots of me, and I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's too much you. <laughs> we need, we need more, more instruction. So I had to find ways to combine points about grammar and spelling and usage with stories about people at the New Yorker and from my own life. And if there was a model at all, and I, I, I think I have my own voice, I don't really think that I used a model and that this book is kind of uncategorizable that way. But the person that I thought of was Ian Frazier, mm -hmm. who can bring humor to any subject. 
So that was kind of my goal, was to write something that was yeah. as good as something that he would do. <laughs> Got it. Speaking of Ian Fraser, a, a mentor of mine mm -hmm. um, who I went to college with, who in a way is, I mean, in a way, probably is the person most responsible for my being on The New Yorker. Um, another mentor of mine told me when I was writing my first novel, write a book that only you can write. And I've always thought about those words when I write anything, mm -hmm. because if it's going to be like something else, first of all, they got there first. Mm -hmm. and even if they didn't do it better, my doing it better isn't going to make my book better. So um, I had a project. I thought I was a little bit worried about my brain and wanted to see if I should be worried and if there was anything I could do about it. And the approach I took was I f I'm kind of an ADD reader, so I write for the ADD reader. And I, it's part funny and part science. And yeah. so I just kind of invented the way I wanted to do it. Right. Um, I wonder if for all of you, I, uh, we could talk a little bit about tone. Because tone, when you're writing memoir, is really a challenge. Um, you know, one step in the wrong direction, and you're tipping over into self-pity. And in the other, if you go the other direction, it can turn into self-aggrandizement. It's very hard to write memoir to keep the tone when you're talking about yourself for two or three hundred pages, to keep the tone in a place where people, where you don't lose your audience, where you are, where you are a, a likable and sympathetic human being. And I wondered if you, as writers, could talk about the challenge of how you find the right tone. Charles, you want to start? Well, memoir is necessarily narcissistic. I mean, so uh, you, you, the, the first draft my editor said, there's not enough of you in it. You're reporting. You're not talking about yourself. It really, you are the protagonist here. It is about you. You have to stay with you. You are the character. And it really requires a level of, of self-aggrandizement that you would, well, that I could never in my uh, normal life muster. And I think it is, we, I think you lean on editors to help you find the line and to pull you back because it does push you so far, well, for me anyway, it push you so far out of what your normal frame of sense of mm -hmm. self is that you're, you're not exactly sure if you're doing too much or if you're pitying yourself or whatever. But and it can be as slight as a it's, word. It can, it's, it's really so, it's slight. So it's really slight. And, you know, um, but, but in, just in terms of, t I, I, I really love this idea of writing a book only you write. I do, the, the idea of singular voice is really important to me and, and, and coming to know what you sound like mm -hmm. is, re is, is I think the only way to really grow into yourself as a writer because only you sound like you. Only you would string those words together. Only you would make those comparisons and I, kept that in the back of my mind when I was writing and remembering to only use references that I would have made in the place that I grew up in this tiny town in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana to only to, you know to to reach for metaphors to which I would have had access in this space um, if it was something that I had never seen that I didn't use that even though I thought, oh, this would have been brilliant to do, but you know, I've ever actually never been to the ocean, so I don't know how to <laughs> describe that. So, um, so, I, so I resisted those and to stay in that space and to, and another thing that was, imp that, that was helpful to me was to not write to the masses, but to write to the imaginary uh, to imagine the people who I'm writing to are the people who I grew up with, mm. to explain it to them. And if I can explain it to them and write to them and make them hear the language of, the beauty of their own language and the cadence of their own language, it becomes real, it becomes human. And you know, Maya said another thing, which is because I am human, nothing can be foreign to me. And I believe that if I push the lens far enough down to the ground, that it just became about human beings, that it would not be foreign to anybody who read it. Uh, let me respond. I, did, I, should, I think I un, unduly self-edited before when we talk about you know, the personal. personal and I, 
I, I talked a little bit too glibly about that question of myself, et cetera, because there was one factor that was there. Um, and for me, melding the personal and the political was the constant mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. And um, the pressure to come out was partly political. That is, I began to feel the inconsistency, fundamental inconsistency to the point of almost a moral failing to be working hard for fairness for LGBT people and not telling people that I was one. Now, I have particular contempt for those closeted gay men, this is men, not lesbians, lesbians don't do this, but it's the closeted gay men who hold political office and vote for anti-gay activity. I believe strongly that the right to privacy is not a right to hypocrisy, and I would expose them. But I, I finally realized it was just, I, I, I was deeply, I, way more than uncomfortable uh, fighting for this, and if it's, if it's such a good thing, then why the hell are you not telling people about yourself? As to the point you made about the controlling the narcissism, there were two elements of my, remember, I'm writing about political events. And I mostly, I wanted to write about political events. The editor said, you gotta put them in the, you know, your, in your personal historical context. That both helped and hurt with the pro problem you talk about. First of all, I never had to worry about my being the most important thing I was writing about, because mm -hmm. I'm writing about the world, which was in almost every instance more important than me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm writing about Clinton's impeachment, or mm -hmm. if I'm writing about uh, the economy, Sometimes I was very, uh, I had a big impact, but I was, you know, I, I was a player in a, in a big set of events. On the other hand, and that made it a little easier. On the other hand, you know, I'm a politician and we uh, make our living in part by persuading people that we are truly wonderful. <laughs> and um, I worry about that tendency. Most political memoirs that I have read, uh, people are taking far too much credit and then nothing wrong ever happened under them. And uh, I wanted this, I, 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 I found there was, I wanted to find a voice that avoided opposite problems. I didn't want to be either uh, non-credibly humble or mm -hmm. uh, unattractively uh, boastful. Yeah. Um, right. And That's it was problem. to try to set <laughs> that. And I, I did that in part, I think, by being pretty factual. I was aware that anything I said was going to be subject to refutation, uh, some of it ideological, and that was important. And um, I also made a point of uh, confessing error on a number of occasions. I think that was, uh, that was uh, an important thing to do, and, and uh, I try to talk about my successes and, and, and my failures. Howdy. Uh, well, I, like Mr. Frank, was writing about a topic that is interesting to people, neuroscience. But I, like you, have really no authority to talk about that. <laughs> I, I really don't know about neuroscience. Um, and one of the scariest things about promoting this book, it's like being in a horrible dream where you didn't know you were enrolled in school and suddenly you're taking your orals <laughs> for neuroscience. When you were taking the movie, you know. I was naked, <laughs> and I didn't pack the right things, and I was in a plane and a tunnel, so um, so I made it about myself, and I'm, and that's all I can add to it is what my experience of it is. Um, I want to correct things I've said in previously, which is I also I'm also was inspired by Nora Ephron, who's mm -hmm. very conversational, and and. Like you, I will acknowledge my mistakes, my my limitations. Mm -hmm. It's it happens to be strategically a very endearing thing to do. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, if I find a sentence is seeming to be too arrogant or full of myself, I'll just add, "I think." Yeah, and, <laughs> but I mean, truly, totally, you do. I mean, there are tricks. It works wonders. There are tricks. I mean, a, a relatedly, a tricks that um, I use is I don't like, I never really write mean things about myself because I don't want to, I would like to be liked, but, um, which is a terrible thing for a writer, but it's true. And, but if I'm going to write about somebody, um, I feel like you could say anything you want if you just say, if you describe them up front as attractive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> It's, it's okay to say, I think, as long as you never say arguably. Uh, that ought to be 
in bed. We got a copy editor and a politician here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, the tone for my book was a little hard to establish, uh, and I was heavily dependent on my editor for that. I give him a lot of credit. Um, I started out, you know, he said, write about dictionaries. So I went to the dictionary, I looked up where I wrote, you know, I wrote this chase, um, chasing a word down in the dictionary and how one thing led to another. I wrote about Noah Webster. I went to his birthplace. I went to all the, these sites. All of this stuff was incredibly boring. <laughs> and I had an editor who cut you know, my visit to Webster's house down to about uh, half a sentence. <laughs> um, but then he would tell me when I got it right. And one of the things that I got right was the introduction. And it just had the right tenor. And he would tell me things like, um, think of the guys on car talk. <laughs> and that, that kind of worked for me. I loved car talk, and I can, I can gab away like that. And then I really did have to count on uh, the editor to cut the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, metaphor of the iceberg, I thought that was original with me. <laughs> Because the first time uh, one of my chapters was edited, I realized, you know, I saw it and I thought, my God, 80% of what I wrote is gone. Mm -hmm. But the part that was left was crystalline and it sounded like me. The editor hadn't added anything. He had just taken away all the stuff that was unnecessary so that um, the, the, what I was writing would come to a point. I'm big on detours, so he would take out all the detours. I understand to that, because I'd done you know, some writing, et cetera, and for me, and I, I dreaded the, I was the hardest part of read, writing was self-editing. For me, uh, now that I'm doing this, being edited makes writing incredibly easier. You, you, it just takes a lot of the burden off you, and I, so I found being edited. Oh, well, that was one of my questions. I was gonna ask what it's like for, for how you all since Mary is the uh, expert in the room, what it's like, I was just gonna ask Mary what it's like to edit, to be edited, but also for, for all of you. You're, but it sounds like you all feel very Edited much not, like you rely edited. heavily on, on the editor's touch. I mean, I know I do. Well, it was a strange feeling for me because you know, as a columnist, you, you know, there is no, there's not, there's not top editing the way that a book is edited, mm -hmm. right? So you, it's more, uh, you, there's a fact checker, then there's there's copy editing mm -hmm. for time style and yeah. things like that. But but they're not saying, oh, I don't really like what you said here. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So <laughs> so you, it, you you know you you it, it, it the the column is the unvarnished person, mm -hmm. and and for good or ill, mm -hmm. um, and so having written that for like seven years, I don't know, six years at that point. And then having to be introduced to a person who I didn't know, who was going to be my editor, and who was having real input about the content of what I was mm -hmm. writing and the tone of it was, was a, a frightening thing. But it turned out to me, I you know I really liked that process, and and you know she saved me from myself mm -hmm. in many cases. Yeah, right. I'm yeah. I'm doing six columns a month now, and uh, it is different because um, columns are easier to say. My biggest problem is organization. It's easy to organize a column. It's about one, maybe two subjects. But I have this constant problem writing. About, it's chronology versus subject matter. I mean, that's a, do you take an issue like service in the military for LGBT people and start with it in 92 and go to its end in 2010? And if you do that, then, then you want to, there's the next issue and there's a little bit kind of, meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, the approach. And the editor was very helpful with, with that. But I had the same kind of suddenly deal with my editor that Mary had, which was I said, but you cannot add anything. You can cut, you can, you do, you, anything in there's got, I have to be the one who wrote it. Right. But, but, but um, dealing with that organization, dealing with excess, is that too cute? Um, my, over, my tendency would be to over argue the case and, and to prove, uh, yes, I would admit that I was wrong, but then I would spend a lot of time. I did spend more time proving how right I was than admitting that. I thought the simple fact yeah. that the admission that I was wrong sufficed. I did say at one point that <laughs> something was the single stupidest thing I'd ever done. But um, uh, the editor, uh, the discipline from the editor as well as the organization, I couldn't write a book without, yeah. without a, an editor I had a great deal of confidence in. Good. Um, Charles, uh, last year I m moderated another memoir panel um, and we 
we're talking about, um, as you know, as all memoir comes down to telling the truth, um, when truth is certainly a moving target. You know, right, right, remembering something essentially changes it. Writing about, as you write memoir, the very fact of what you remember changes. And um, Richard Hoffman, who was on the panel, said, um, the genre is not governed by truth, it's governed by honesty. Um, your book is searingly honest, and I wondered if you could talk about the process of excavating the truth and where you, at some point, as a writer and as a human being who has lived many years, lets loose from the truth and focuses on, or, on honesty. No, I, I try not. No, I did not try to let go of the truth ever. I don't I mean. mean but, I don't mean but, change it. But we all have to acknowledge the fact that what we remember changes over well, time. I, I will acknowledge the fungibility of, of memory, yeah. and particularly childhood memory. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, my book opens with a uh, a false memory, right? But but acknowledging right up front that. I remembered this happening this way, and my mother. I asked my mother about it, and she said that's not the way it happened at all. And I wanted to open it that way mm -hmm. to establish the mm -hmm. very idea right. that childhood memories are flexible. We don't we we fix things in our heads the way we need them to be made, and that is not necessarily the way that they happened, and that it requires a tremendous amount of uh, research to make sure that what you are saying is the truth. And there were tricks to that, as you, as you mentioned before, like there were things I would say as it was told to me. Mm -hmm. Now, there, I, there's, there were some stories in the book that there was no way for me to check them. And all I could say is that I, this is the way I remember this story being told to me my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote it, I would say, as it was told to me or as I remember people saying, and then I would write it in that way. And that was a way for me not to, ch to net check those particular things that I thought were really important because they were part of the fabric of my life whether I could check them or not. Other things though, however, I mean, I write about the cemetery. I spent, I don't know how many trips I've went, days I would just go and sit in the cemetery. And because I wanted to remember what it, what it felt like, what it felt like when the, when the breeze moved through and the leaves rustled, I wanted to remember the spacing between the graves of my great grandparents. I wanted to remember where uh, my cousin's twin brother was stillborn and where we, the grave we thought it was, but we ne it was never marked, so we couldn't find it. To be able to write about that, w it was important to me to, to have researched that as well as I could mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. have done. The, the house that I grew up in it was still on our property. My mother built another house next door to it, but on the same property. But the house was still there in the room that I had slept in and my great grandmother had died in was still there, the colors were still the same, the, w the curtains were still on the, on the windows. And I would, every time I would go home for a holiday, I'd just go sit in my old room, the way that the bed faced, so that I could remember the proportions of the room, that I could remember what it felt like to be in the room, that, that if I had written a piece about, about something that happened in the room, ch my, the childhood sexual abuse happened in that room, mm -hmm. if I would, kind of say it to myself in that space to make sure that I had the sense was right, mm -hmm. that I remember how small I was in this space. So, and, and to look at every picture ever, like every picture that was online of the town, every picture that my mother had of our family, how, how everybody, the way that I remember a person looked, that they actually looked that way. Um, all of that was research to make sure that it was, what I wrote was my best both <laughs> journalistic mm -hmm. uh, effort at finding the truth, but also my, in, uh, my artistic expression of trying to convey it. Yeah. Great. Can I say something? Yes. I have the opposite happen to me, which is I think that though I'm writing nonfiction officially, I consider myself a novelist, I consider myself a fiction writer, I consider myself a comedy writer. So that, and my job is to entertain you. And it really isn't that important if I get, yeah, I get the neuroscience right. right. <laughs> but when I wrote my first novel, it was, I was like, wow, I can Google everything and I can get this scene exactly right. And I found that I was conveying so much information mm -hmm. that it was, 
it might have been relevant in a way, mm -hmm. but it was boring. Mm -hmm. And that I'm always actually stripping the information away and getting at how I feel right. or, 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 or something. Right. Because I find, you know, and in this book that I wrote, you can get a whole lot if you just go on the internet right. about what I'm writing about. So that I was always aware of not conveying too much information because when I have a hard time writing information, you know, just factually in a way that's not the encyclopedia. Right. So that I'm always adding comedy to it. Well, that's what makes memoir writing an art is that you're mm -hmm. taking, I mean, it, it wouldn't be, what makes them beautiful and what makes them work is that you are bringing something mm -hmm. other than mm -hmm. base I, facts to the... I, I, again, the, the, here my experience I think differs greatly from others. So there is this problem in a lot of the political stuff I read, frankly, political memoirs, where the problem is not that people don't remember things that happened, it is they remember things that didn't. Um, <laughs> and I, I, th that, I think, is an endemic kind of a problem. But, I was writing mostly about facts. Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to give my interpretation of them and particularly what they mean. As I think about it, I, this panel is, you know, it's helpful to think about these things. There was one personal element, I, because, but it was important factually. I mean, I, I, two themes, the great increase in support for LGBT equality and the concurrent decrease in support for the government. So that when I start out, uh, I think I'll never be able to be active in politics because I'm a homosexual and everybody hates us and you gotta be popular to be in government. And by the time I retire, a pollster tells me literally that my marriage to my husband in my last year in Congress received much more social approval than my chairmanship on the financial reform. <laughs> <laughs> literally true. Um, but what, what I, my, I, so I had a factual frame. Mm -hmm. uh, but here are the two, two, two points. First of all, I, when I was in office, I really did put effectiveness ahead of ego because, not that I was self-sacrificing, I was pretty secure in my district. And the point is this, if you are successful in working out a deal and you talk about it, that's the last deal you make. You cannot talk about how you got this person to do that. You can't, you know, you, you, you can't show how it's being done mm -hmm. because you then compromise the people you were with. So there were a lot of things that I had done that I was proud of having done and how I maneuvered it mm -hmm. uh, that I told afterwards because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't here trying to do that anymore and you know, it, it was long enough ago. So there was that. Uh, and there was an important factual element that I had, that I knew that I had kept quiet. The other though is I knew what I had done, but I didn't know what other people were doing. So the danger I was aware of was that I might be taking too much credit mm -hmm. because yes, I did do this and that and got this done, but I, there may be other people working behind the scenes as well, and I had to try to try to allow for that. Um, I have, I'm gonna ask one more quick question and then we're gonna open it up to all of you. Um, this is for Patty, since you're the memory expert. What would you tell the aspiring memoirist about ways to access their memory? Are there exercises or machines or what, what, what have you learned that you, that if that there are people out there that want to write memoirs, what would you say? Was, is there any science that you can impart? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember once listening to Mary Carr speak and somebody said in the audience, I want to write a memoir, but my memory's really horrible. What should I do? <laughs> and she said, maybe you shouldn't write a memoir. <laughs> uh, it depends what kind of memory. I mean, you know, write a memoir about how, what a bad memory you have is what I basically did. I. Okay. Um, let's open it up to all of you. We have a little bit of time. I'm sure you have questions. Um, I guess come to the mic um, and introduce yourselves and, and direct your questions specifically to either the whole panel or the um, particular writer you would like to ask. Yeah, um, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> Nobody knows the name of their congressman in New York. Mm -hmm. And so this is a question for Bonnie Frank. Memoirs, by necessity, are missing the last chapter, or two, hopefully three. Mm -hmm. um, but in that, I remember a remark you may have made 
about the Speaker of the House saying when you came out that he had hoped you would be the speaker, the first Jewish speaker, and that, of course, didn't happen. Had it happened, what would that chapter have been like? Well, first, let me say, I acknowledge what you say about a lot of people not knowing who their congressman is, and uh, I cite that because I do make it a point when any of them complain to me about Congress to ask them who their member is. And those who are unable to answer the question have lost my interest from then on. If they don't know enough to know who their member of Congress is, that's their fault if he's a bum, not mine. Um, and yes, Tip O'Neill did say that. He, he, he said, uh, as, and I was very flattered when he said he thought I, might be, I was going to be the first Jewish speaker. Uh, he also said that that wasn't going to happen because I had come out of the room. <laughs> he, was a, he, was, he was a wonderful man, and he got the music right, but he had trouble with the words. <laughs> I would have, uh, and by the way, I don't differ greatly from Nancy Pelosi in this, who was the, the speaker when I was there. Um, Project matter, I think I probably would have had our financial reform bill come first before the health care bill to do something that was overwhelmingly popular. What I would have done is, it's a conscious thing. I believe we have a problem in which people like various things that government does, but dislike government in general. And some of my colleagues try to play into that, but you cannot have a whole that is smaller than the sum of the parts. And to the extent that government in general is unpopular, it compresses your ability to do anything. So I would have made a more conscious effort to focus on those things which were the most popular and make clear to people that this is, in fact, part of government. But, but you know, the speaker is operating in this broader context of who else is elected. And uh, um, like a lot of public offices, the speaker looks much more important from outside than from his chair. Another question? My name is Priscilla Vecklitz. And I'm wondering, once you put all of your heart and soul telling your story, and the intimacies of it, who, who are you now? Who do you become now? A post-memoirist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't feel changed by it. I mean, I, you know, in some specific cases, I hope people have a better understanding of a couple of controversies. But I, I mean, I don't feel depleted, and in fact, to the extent that people have read it and talk about it, it's kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's empowering. Charles? I, I do think it, 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 it for me, it was uh, a bit of a change. Uh, maybe a liberation, I, I don't know if that's too strong a word. But, you know, I've been in the news business my entire life. I know this about news. Uh, you, uh, somebody finds out your story, it belongs to them. You tell it, it belongs to you, right? Uh, it was important for this story to belong to me. Uh, and, and all of the blemishes and all of the mistakes that I had made that I, that it was important for me to, to confess them uh, rather than for someone to ever ask me or say, oh, I, oh, I talked to a friend who grew up with you and this is what he told me. Um, and there is a certain liberty in having conversations with people where you feel like you are no longer hiding anything. I, I now literally say to people, you know, people say, oh, oh well, who are you? I say, I, my life is literally an open book, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, and, and this, this is a beauty in that. And I think that, and I have found, one thing that, that, was, um, that I was embarrassed about is that, is the degree to which, um, I had, I did not trust my own friends. That I went to therapy for a year before this book came out and I said, okay, you have to help me because my life is gonna be over. So help me to figure out what's gonna happen when the, when I, whatever this new life is, what that's gonna be. And he says, Charles, your life is not gonna be over. I said, oh, that's very sweet, but it's gonna be over. Can you get on board and help me with this? Um, and, and I called all, I made a list of all my friends and I called them and I said, I'm not gonna send you an email, I'm gonna to talk to you about this because this is, this is something I have to tell you because I've written it down. Um, and 201, they were the most gracious 
generous, supportive people. I mean, they, they were the friends that I thought that they were. And I had assumed that they would all have problems. And they none did. And that was, and it, so I immediately set out to think about, could I write a book about friendship? Because it was, it was such an extraordinary thing for me to, to watch my friends re respond um, to this book. My question is directed to Congressman Frank. First of all, thank you for the service that you have given uh, to our nation. And, uh, thank you, thank you. I hope that you will uh, continue to write political memoirs. That being said, uh, I wonder what your memoir will say uh, about your future memoir will say, political memoir that is, will say about the phenomena that is Donald Trump. <laughs> well, you won't have to wait that long because I, I, I am in, I'm, I'm thinking in my head now about the column I plan to write for Politico. I write for them twice a month. And I think people do analogies. Uh, the Donald Trump phenomenon to me reminds me some of the George Wallace candidacy in 1964. And there's this, yes, he's a fool and a clown. The sad thing is the degree to which people who vote in Republican primaries are supporting him. He's not gonna get the nomination. I have not lived a good enough life to be rewarded by his being <laughs> a Republican nominee. But, and I sympathize, frankly, can you imagine being a Republican serious candidate, although people with whom I disagree, trying to have a debate with him? It's kind of like, it's going to be like playing Hamlet and Curly from the Three Stooges <laughs> is playing Polonius. But, but here's the problem. The problem for the Republican Party is, and they are reaping what they have sown, that his meanness and his denigration of other people and his anger, his incivility, his total disrespect for anybody else apparently resonates with a significant part of their party. And that is something that they, he didn't drop out of the sky, you know, as a, as a political figure. I forget the guy, Tom, he writes the op-ed column in, in the Times. Yeah, Tim Egan, who said, hey, how dare he say that about John McCain? But what do they do to John Kerry? An equally distinguished veteran. Or, and then my husband said, and what do they do to the lesbian and gay men and women in the military who had served so well and got trashed? So I think this is a problem for the Republicans, not just in the disarray of this year, but going forward. Uh, look, this was a problem for the Democrats, and I remember, I'm, you know, I was politically active at the time. Yeah, Lyndon Johnson won, but the fact that George Wallace was getting such a big vote in 64 and again in 68 meant that there was an element in our party, our party people who voted for us, who were going to be a problem. And in fact, that happened. From 68 on, we have had this phenomenon of white working class guys uh, repudiating what we had thought was, was their general view. So I think the, 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 what the Trump phenomenon means is not simply that it's going to hurt them this time, but you cannot win a national election, fortunately, it seems to me, if you are projecting anything like the views that he projects. And I, they're going to have a hell of a hard time cleansing themselves from that politically damaging element. And I hope they will begin to realize it's important not just to disagree with Donald Trump, but to disagree with and repudiate that whole angry, vicious, vituperative, denunciatory style. I will say one last thing I'm going to quote. There's a very funny comedian named Jimmy Tingle from the Boston area. I guess he's been, yeah. He, and, I went to a show and he said, I'm going to do something. He's, I really respected him. He said, I'm going to do something a lot of comedians don't do. I'm going to tell you my favorite joke that I've heard recently, and it's not mine. I read it on the internet. And it was a picture of Donald Trump, and it said, we shall overcome. <laughs> we have time for one more quick question. Hi, uh, my name is David Caldwell. This question is directed to Charles. Um, you talked earlier about the lack of resources as far as like therapeutic resources when you were younger, you know, growing up where you did. And this question could be for the rest of the panel as well, but 
you know, I come from a mental health background, and I'm wondering just how therapeutic is it to write a memoir, or how cathartic, you know, can it be? Um, so again, Charles and anyone else who has any other comments? I think it's, uh, there is a therapeutic part of it. Um, I always say that I write what I can't say. Um, and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in, in my real life, I'm kind of silly. Um, but in the writing, it's not. It's, it's incredibly sober and to, sometimes to a fault. Uh, and I can, it can be dark in places and even the column can um, drift into what can sound like pessimism, although I am kind of, I always think of myself as eternally optimistic. But I, it, uh, part of me puts it there. Uh, I park all of the, the, the baggage um, in, in the writing because I know that I can express it there and I can express it back to myself. And a lot of times I'm writing, not necessarily for the reader, but I'm writing for me. I'm writing for the child who I was in this memoir. Like, I'm trying to explain it back to him to make it make sense to him. Uh, you know, one of, the, I, I, uh, one of the breakthrough moments for me in just trying to understand it was you know my youngest son was uh, I walked into the living room and he's watching television he's upside down in my favorite chair he's upside down he's he's always upside down he can walk on his hands better than we can walk on our feet and he's watching cartoons upside down with his legs over the back of the chair and it's just it's it's kind of you know innocent and cute and he's seven years old and he's so small and he looks very much like what, he's the one of my kids who looks the most like me. And it hit me how small a seven-year-old it is. And, and the thing about, that was the, the year in which I, um, the, the childhood sexual abuse happened. And, it, and the thing about trauma is that it stays with you as your conscious mind, right? So you're processing it as you age. And so at 45, I will look back at that trauma and process it with a 45-year-old sensibility rather than with a seven-year-old sensibility. And you're constantly thinking, if I had done this wrong, differently, done that different, told this person to. But the seven-year-old was not equipped to do that. And being able to forgive the seven-year-old for being seven was really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all. This was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.